Ninth Story Studios, giving story a voice. This is The Wicked Library. Warning. The Wicked Library is a horror fiction podcast created for a mature audience. Our stories contain graphic descriptions of pain, murder, violence, blood, betrayal, and inhumanity. Monsters win, people die, and hope is often shattered. There is also beauty, heart, catharsis, and raw emotion. What triggers fear may be deeply personal, but we all share it. If at any time a story takes you to a place too dark, turn on the lights, press pause, or press stop. And always remember that, unlike in the real world, these nightmares and your participation are under your control. Welcome to the darkness in between, our interseasonal entertainment, as we are hard at work on season 11. I'm Daniel Foytek, and I thank you for listening. A big thank you to those who took the time to rate the show five stars and write a short review for us on iTunes. Your reviews help others find the show, and of course, we love hearing from you. A big thank you to those of you who are supporting the show. Without you, this show would not be possible our authors, and everyone involved in making the show, thank you for your ongoing support of this show and of independent horror fiction. If you're not yet supporting the show, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wicked library. For as little as $3 a month, you can keep making the show you love possible and get fun rewards. We really do rely on this support to help us pay the authors, voice actors, composer, and artists. We don't believe any of them should work for free, so we make sure that we pay them, and your support makes that possible. In addition to knowing that you're a part of making this show possible, you also get fun rewards like ad-free episodes of the show at higher bit rates, access to bonus stories, and at higher levels of support even more. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash wicked library. Lastly, we're excited to announce that we have started posting a weekly book review and recommendation column to the wickedlibrary.com. The column is called Fully Booked with Brianna Morgan, and you'll find reviews with a strong focus on indie and small press books. Head to the wickedlibrary.com forward slash booked to check it out, and watch our Twitter feed at Wicked Library for notices when new reviews post every week. And now, without further ado, let's get wicked. A Feast for St. Hubert by Patrick Moody Get home, my full-fed goats, get home. The evening star draws on. Virgil, Eclogues Clear moonlight bathed the meadow, and Brother Gordon's aim was true. The arrow sank into his prey's neck, dropping at the moment it loped from the pine cover. It lay motionless but that didn't mean it was dead. Gordon took a long draft of coffee from his thermos and readied a second arrow. Satisfied after a time, he climbed down from the stand and stalked through the grass until he came upon his catch. He gave it a push with his boot. The carcass had already begun to stiffen. Good. He examined it, noting the blood and bits of gore flecked about the snout and beneath the jaw, in the beds of the claws, too. It had gotten into a scrape or had done its own hunting earlier. Gordon bound it in a tarp and rope and lugged it towards his truck, a good quarter mile down the old deer path. He'd wished he'd made his coffee a bit stronger. 
The carcass jostled as Gordon drove the rutted dirt road, and every time it made a considerable bang against the bed, Gordon peered up at the rear view. He'd left his arrow firmly lodged in the neck. Once he got back, he would hand it over to Brother Kwame to be field dressed, and then to Sister Leo, skilled in taxidermy, who would sever the head and prepare it for the trophy room. Brother Uve would take the choicest cuts and prepare them for the night's feast. It was best to eat the meat the same night as the kill. Necessary, really. Gordon found it spoiled quicker than most game, and left one ill for some time, if not consumed right away. He passed over a small wooden bridge, turning on his high beams as the road grew narrow and the forest more dense until St. Hubert's Lodge came into view. It was a log structure, with a single tower and a peaked roof that slanted to the ground in Scandinavian fashion. Sister Leo and Brother Kwame were waiting for him near the entrance. What is it? he asked, stepping down from his truck. There's someone here, Sister Leo said. One of them. Gordon paused. Brother Kwame spat wiping his hand across his beard. He came willingly? Sister Leo nodded. Waltzed right up just before sundown. Called to us from the stream there. Gordon looked back at the stream, which was a generous name for it. A man could cross it in a single step if he stretched himself. Anybody speak with him? Sister Leo shook her head, pulling on the ear flaps of her wool hat said he was waiting for the lodge master. All right, we set him up in the trophy room. Gordon thought of the mounted heads, some so old they were kept in glass, the ones they didn't display openly, the ones they couldn't. To scare him? I don't think that's possible, Sister Leo mused. Gordon eyed her. You'll see, she said. Brother Kwame spat once more. What is it? Don't know the big man said, studying the woods. Don't like it. You think I do? Just be careful, Sister Leo o told him. We'll post up out here. Gordon jerked a thumb at his truck. Got a good catch tonight. Take it out to the shed? We'll handle it. Keep warm, Gordon told them. He made his way to the lodge. A hundred pairs of glossy black eyes greeted him in the entry hall. Stag heads decorated each wall from rafter to baseboard antlers twisting up like ivory vines. A large stone fireplace dominated the hall, and above it, an oil painting of the symbol of St. Hubert, their patron, a stag with radiant cross between branched horns. Down the corridor, he passed bows set on iron pegs. Small plaques were set beneath the weapons, noting the deeds of their owners. The first were the oldest, simple wooden bows unpolished and beginning to splinter. The hunters who carried them had been dead for centuries. As Gordon neared the locked door, the bows evolved from wood to aluminum alloy and carbon fiber, large compound models that looked more at home in a science fiction battleground than a hunting lodge. He stopped for a moment to gaze at his own name written beneath the last of them. His crossbow wouldn't be mounted until his hunting days were over. He wondered if it had been a good idea to leave it in the truck. He reached for the chain around his neck and felt the sacramental, metal cone that was St. Hubert's key. The door opened with a groan. Thought you, Lodge Master. Gordon didn't answer as he stepped inside. The heads looked down with fierce expressions. Rage and disbelief in the last moments before death. A man was seated in a high-backed chair in the middle of the room. Leo and Kwame had lit several oil lamps along the walls. Gordon pulled up another chair, careful not to set it too close to his guest. Six feet, he thought. No, better make it ten. He had restraints around his ankles. Gordon judged him to be around sixty, maybe early seventies but he was stout and had the sinewy build of a man who spent his life working a farm. Gordon was relieved to see the chain. A farmer's strength 
was very real. I want you to thank your doe and buck for me, for their kindness. Kindness? The old-timer wiggled an ankle, rattling the chain. They put it on my bare skin. Stuff was irritating terrible. They undid the chain and let me unroll my trousers. He paused, making a clicking sound with his tongue. I understand why they had to do it, or why they thought they did. So no harm done. Though, you should know most of all, Buck, that I'm no threat. No threat at all. No, Gordon said. It doesn't look that way, does it? No, I had to do something to show you and your bucks that I come in good faith. Did a number on myself. He sniffed. I passed over a river, a front. Can still smell the damp, though. The wall's leaking. The stream circles the lodge, Gordon told him. The old man leaned back. Ah, figures. Smart, Buck. Real smart. I'm Brother Gordon, the Lodge Master. Lodge Master. <laughs> like it, Buck. Like the sound of it. I'm Morris. Morris? You got it. I don't suppose I can get a surname. Don't suppose you could, seeing as I can't recollect it. Again, he sniffed. Hunt tonight? Smell like you did. Got fair tufts on your coat. Gordon shifted. Does anyone else know you're here? Nope. You can tell your bucks to relax out there. Came of my own volition. He dragged the word out, like he was tasting it. Morris, if that really was his name, and Gordon was certain it wasn't, spoke in such a strange way that he couldn't place it. That accent. What was it? He needed more coffee, and he was hungry. He hoped Uwe would get to work on that meat soon. Hey, Buck, you got a rag? Morris held out the one that he'd been using. This thing's caked already. I don't think it's sopping anything up anymore. In a bit, Gordon said. Why don't you tell me why you're here, Morris? How did you find this place? Morris laughed. <laughs> Let's see, answer the second. This place isn't as well hid as you'd have everyone believe, Buck. There is some who know about you all too well. And the first? Come to see if you need some help. Gordon cocked his head. Help? Word is you took out someone important a while back. Someone with influence. Didn't help your cause none, hunting him the way you did. Their numbers are a growing buck. How many bowmen you got in this lodge? Enough, Gordon answered, and we're not the only one. Oh, I know it. But you're the, what's it called? The centerpiece. The main one. Ain't that right, Lodge Master? Nice title. I mean that. Rings. Powerful. What do you mean their numbers are growing? Just what I said. The young ones, they're propagating. Even congregating. Bet you didn't know they did that. You've only seen them one at a time, haven't you? Gordon said nothing. Morris grinned. Got funny ideas in their skulls. They don't hold to the same traditions. Don't even go to the old places anymore. Figure they can move right in anywhere they choose. Your places. And when there's enough of them, all jabbering about this and that and, hey, let's take the fight to them, well, you're going to have a mess on your hands, Buck. A mess I don't think you or even that dead fella you hold as a patron can clean up. There's less of you than there used to be. We've known that for some time. Where do they meet? Oh, deep forests, old cellars, lonely farms. Morris leaned forward. They don't act the way they were raised to. 
They act like you, Buck. Because they've been watching. None of the elders have stepped up? Oh, we've tried. Most of us that could. Don't help. Our brains ain't addled, but try telling them that. Fathers and mothers teach plenty of lessons. Like yours do, I'm sure. But which ones stick? How old are you, Morris? You know, I can't rightly remember. Bullshit. It's the truth, Buck. Again, he paused to sniff the air around him. How many flowers you got in this room? It stinks. Makes my thoughts run cloudy. Gordon looked up at the rafters, where bundles of dried petals hung from wicker baskets. Enough, he said. Monkswood? Aconite? Marigolds. Ah, Morris said, wiping at his face with a soiled rag. That'll do it. Good. Smart box. You have, uh, an impressive sense of smell. Thank you. Always had excellent... What do you call them, uh... Old factories. Olfactory. That's what I said. I can smell you. Can practically see you. Coffee on your chin, probably, and... Hmm. Tomato and olive oil. Gordon looked at his hands. How the hell did he know what he'd made for dinner? You use that on all your kills? Meat's not good enough for you? We don't eat it for the taste. No, we eat it for the sacrament. Ah, thought saintly folks weren't into that kind of magic. It's not magic, Gordon said. Just tradition. Yeah, Morris mused. I remember those. Which leads me back to why I came. The young ones. They're coming. And they're coming soon. Maybe in the town, maybe a city. Still got cities, right? You want that? Of course I don't. But why don't you? Been your goal all along, hasn't it? Morris scoffed. Me? No. None of their gray hairs, neither. It's a big world out there, big enough to slip away forever, seems like. We keep away for a reason. Biggest one's sitting across from me right now. So what do you propose? I'd like to join in the hunt. Silence hung between the two men. Can you? Well, Morris said, not like I used to. But the instinct's still there. I can track. Smelled the marigolds, didn't I? Heard the water through the walls. Made it past that buck posted up a quarter mile up the stream. And smelled my pasta sauce, Gordon thought. Only thing is, and here's the part I figured you'd like, Buck. I can't change. Not any more after what I done. He leaned forward so Gordon could get a clear view of his gouged-out eye sockets. He dropped the bloodied rag. Now, get a real good look. Think, Buck. How you suppose we get around to changing? It's these. He jabbed two fingers into one of the sockets. Can I get a cleaner rag now? You did that to yourself? Not just this evening, Morris said. Only way I figured it to get your bucks to take me serious. He sniffed. But not you. I can smell it. I'm right, aren't I? Think I'm a... Uh, what did you say? Bullshitter. I don't know, Gordon answered truthfully, uneased by the lengths to which Morris had gone and savaging himself. But, he said, there is a way for me to be sure. Morris sat back. Won't hurt, will it? Gordon stood. I'm going to release your binds. I know you can smell just near everything, but obviously you can't see, which is why you haven't sensed the crossbow I've got pointed at your gut. Well, I need to use it. Morris leaned his head back. Lamplight seeped oddly into one of the sockets. No, Buck. 
I won't give you a reason to. Gordon was careful to step behind Morris. For good measure, he took the cone from around his neck, nudged the sharp point into Morris's shoulder, hoping it would feel the same as an arrowhead, and unlocked the ankle restraints. He stepped back, allowing Morris to stand and stretch. We have an observatory, Gordon told him. One of the sisters keeps close watch on the stairs. I suppose you know the state of them tonight. I do, Morris said. That's why I came when I did. I want you to walk in front of me. Fine by me, Morris said. Just point me in the right direction, Buck. Carefully, Gordon led Morris through the trophy room and out into the hall, much narrower than the ones showcasing the old bows. Woodcuts adorned the walls. St. Hubert is a wayward aristocrat. St. Hubert in the forest. St. Hubert butchering his stag. The apparition. The promise. The golden cross and ivory horns staying the arrow that was to be his last. He eats all your killers, Buck. We do. Us too. We don't kill as many, though. About twenty-five, thirty a year. That keeps us in meat enough. How about you? Ever figure a number? We keep the head, so yes. Ah. And work the skins and sew the fur, too, eh? Makes for good insulation. True. Ours, too. The one you bagged tonight. A ten-pointer? Nearly. Good for you, Buck. Bet you're a fine shot. Have to be, I assume. Lodge master and all. I have my moments, Gordon admitted. Though Brother Kwame is more skilled. He uses a longbow. Made it from an old diagram. The kind the Brits used at Agincourt. Trained over a year to master it. I use a crossbow most times. Ah. Kwame sounds like a noble man. Did you know Longbowmen were one of the few full-time soldiers on the Crown's payroll? That's the strain of it. The skill. The muscle. Very specific weapon. Takes a dedicated professional to use it. Years of training. Like school. He dabbed at the congealed blood where his eyes had been. But a crossbow. Gordon could hear the disdain in his voice. You know the English wouldn't use them, right? Not for a while, at least. Said it was an unchristian way to kill. I like that. For them, it was fine so long as you did it with some skill. Once the French got crossbows, they made a real mess for them. Suppose it's because anyone with two hands and a trig finger could wield one. Women and children. And to be killed by a woman in those days. Men would just as soon fall on their swords for that happened. You have does here, Buck. Yes, sisters. One of them chained, you remember? Quicker to load than a long bow, Morris continued, not hearing or choosing not to hear. No training. So they killed and killed in the unchristian way. <laughs> oh, did they ever. <laughs> Morris slapped his thigh with a hoot. Think of that. Uh, training all your life to heft that bow, and suddenly you're stuck by some fawn crouched in the bushes. Thank you for the history lesson, Gordon said, wishing his crossbow truly were aimed at Morris's back. Well, I figured if anyone would find it interesting, it would be you, Buck. Say, you've killed your share of fawns and kids, right? When I had to. Same as you. Me? Never. Hardly any meat on them. But you still string them up and slice the best bits, I suppose. Could be tasty. Could be. But they ain't ten pointers, no, sir. How do they hide? I wondered if you bucks set traps for them, or just wait like you do for the oldens. We trap from time to time, Gordon said. Not often. That's good. Might as well let them grow, so you got something to be proud of. 
Morris kept talking as they ascended the winding steps of the tower. Gordon wondered if he talked so much because he was afraid. The door opened into a circular room, half of its domed ceiling built of thick glass. Sister Aiko's large telescope dominated the center, a hulking thing of brass and iron. Along the curved walls were equally curved bookshelves and models of the planets set among scattered star charts. I can feel it, Morris said. Gordon tensed, looking around for something heavy and sharp, should he need it. The light. Calm yourself, Buck. I can feel the light is all. Like stepping out from shade and feeling the kiss of the sun. Morris took a few more steps until he stood center below the glass dome. Shall I? Still scanning for a suitable weapon, Gordon nodded, realized Morris couldn't sniff out a nod, then, his voice sounding weaker than he meant it, told him yes. Morris wiped one more time at his gouged eyes and held his face up to the moon. A strange smile turned his lips, and he held out his arms in salutation. Gordon watched his fingers, his neck, his ears, waiting. You know, he said, if it does happen, I have to kill you. Figure as much. Sweat ran down Gordon's neck. He grasped onto the cone sacramental for comfort. I still feel as good, Morris said. At least there's that. After a few moments, Gordon relaxed. So Morris wasn't lying. He wouldn't change. Not anymore. Do you miss it? Not now, Morris said. But I will, Buck. I will. How much longer till your mind's eased? A bit, Gordon said, studying him. Just a bit. I can tell. I can tell you where the last meeting was, Morris said. You know that old farm off the interstate? The one that got gutted in the fire years back, and no one sought to mend it? There's a big root cellar there, and expanded over the years, right near the grain silo. They dig and mortar it, nights. Others put up support beams during the day. Gordon made a mental note, and wondered how many brothers and sisters would be enough for the job, and how the job would even be attempted. They weren't exterminators. They'd never heard of anyone going after a group underground like that. It didn't feel sportsmanlike, and that bothered him. Reckon you could burn them, Morris said, moving in a slow, ambling circle in the moonlight. But that seems cruel, Buck. Real cruel. Do you know when they're meeting next? No, but I can find out. Track the leaders. Morris did something curious then. He held out his hand. Index, pointer, and ring fingers, Gordon noted, were of equal length. Partners of the hunt, Morris said. Gordon let go of the sacramental, extending his own hand in disbelief. When they clasped. What then? Had this ever been done before? Ever been tried? He looked to the moon and wondered what St. Hubert would think. Gordon found Morris's shake to be as strong as he assumed it was. Morris squeezed hard. He knew that men liked strong handshakes. He smelled the dried blood on Gordon's clothes. Just a hint. He doubted Gordon even knew it was there. A shrill cry echoed somewhere deep in the lodge. Teeth sank into Gordon's shoulder, the immense pressure cutting into his tendons. He felt a pop, and his legs failed. Above him, Morris shook his head, letting the skin and muscle fly about the observatory. Without pause, he bent down, grabbed Gordon by the neck, and lifted him. Lifted him high, much higher than a man so old should have been able to do. He punched Gordon in his liver, again, again, again. Don't need the eyes, he was laughing. Moon glow runs deep in the blood. Is your Saint Hubert looking down? Ha! I think he'd be looking up. 
I'll dig him out of that grave and find out just how well he's kept watch. Gordon tried to speak, but his severed tendon prevented him from moving his mouth. My nerves, he thought maniacally. He's damaged my nerves. I wanted to be here for the feast, Morris said. You bucks were having one tonight, yes? Gordon could only moan. He felt tears well in his eyes, but they dribbled down numb cheeks. Aw, oh, Buck, Morris said softly, and put him to sleep. Laughter rocked the dining hall. Gordon awoke at the head of the table, slumped in the lodge master's chair. He didn't recognize the men around him. They satiated themselves like Roman revelers, hands moving fast among the plates and bowls, the cups overrun. Everything stank of blood. He is awake, one of them said, and stabbed a cut of meat, offering it with his fork. Our buck doesn't look hungry. A hand fell on his shoulder, and he found Morris behind him. Tonight they give thanks to their man-patron, Hubert he said to the revelers, who chortled, many of them upending goblets of blood that splashed over their faces and onto the table. We should thank him, too. His bucks are tender, are they not? Gordon looked around the room, trying to make sense of the madness. Those are the best, said a man with a big red-stained beard. His eyes were like the yolk of an egg. Lucky we found two. <laughs> He turned to share a chuckle with his companions, giving Gordon a full view of the arrow lodged in his neck. My arrow. Gordon scanned the room, trying to see over the dim glow of lanterns and candles, the smoke, the steam rising from plates of viscera and intestines and choice flesh. The exit was thirty paces away. Did his legs still work? He moved them to make sure. His truck was parked just outside. The crossbow should be resting on the passenger side floor. Three arrows were loaded, and the quiver was beside it. If he could make it, there might be a chance, at least enough to give himself time to make a call and take some out before they fell upon him. Walk with me, Morris whispered, his mouth just behind Gordon's ear. His breath smelled of iron. The diners bade him good evening chewing open-mouthed and gesturing with pieces of snapped bone as Morris led him from the dining hall and down the corridor to the trophy room. Impressive, the eyeless elder said, feeling the bows on the walls as he passed. I looked for your crossbow in the observatory. Funny, I couldn't find it. He opened the door, shoving Gordon in first. Simeon field dresses him does an excellent job rendering the skin from the muscle. Real clean. He tans the hides and makes fine clothing. Sislav boils the bones. He has a keen interest in them. Says Hunter's bones produce the best marrow. I told Virgil once. He didn't believe me. The trophy room was dark. Gordon walked carefully, just as blind as Morris. Galen is uh, our best taxidermist, Morris said. You know what he does? He stuffs the heads with a poultice that has marigolds in it. I thought you'd like that. He takes great pride in his work. A match flickered to life, and with it the wick of an oil lamp. Light flooded the room, casting long shadows across the floor. Look, Morris said. We've hunted well tonight. You eat flesh to honor your sacrament. Do you know why we eat it? Gordon was no longer listening. He could only stare up at the wall mounts, where heads of wolves had become faces of men. Today's author was Patrick Moody with his story, A Feast for St. Hubert. Today's story was told by Daniel Foytek. That's me. To find out more about today's author, please visit thewickedlibrary.com and look at Patrick's bio page. Our lead editor and executive producer is Scarlett R. Algie. Our resident composer and executive producer is Nico Vitese of We Talk of Dreams. 
Artwork for today's episode was created by Jeanette Andromeda, our art director and executive producer. Our showrunner and producer is Daniel Foytek. That's me. The Wicked Library is created by Ninth Story Studios. All rights reserved.